When I first started using Obsidian, my primary use case for it was work. And I still do use it for that, but since then I have also discovered other use cases, most notably tabletop role-playing games. So in this video, I'm going to take you through how I prepare for a D&D &D or Dungeons & Dragons game as a DM in Obsidian. Maybe I should say up front that this video probably isn't going to be too interesting to you if you don't play D&D &D or other TTRPGs. So I run this campaign weekly and we use the D&D 5e game system and the setting of Exandria, created by Matt Mercer of Critical Role. So this is my main world page for this campaign. This is a map that I kind of customized from the maps that are available with the source books. And the players are my husband and my stepdaughter. So it's kind of like a family game. I am a very new DM. I've only been DMing for about a year and a half. And that's been almost solely online. I've run a few games for other friends and family, but I only have the one regular game. So take what I say with a grain of salt. This is just how I'm trying to sort through this whole DMing thing in Obsidian. So this is the map of Wild Mount, at least, in Exandria. And I have this map here for other people because I publish all of these notes online in my Obsidian publish site. But I do sometimes have these leaflet maps as well. Just for me, I comment them out like this so that they don't kind of mess up my published notes. But I like to have these little markers. And so if I click on one, Port Damali goes to Port Damali. So if we go to characters here, the party is called the Slayers 5, and the two actual players are Boris and Aura. And Boris is my husband's character. He is a half-orc barbarian fighter. We are at level 9 right now. Aura is a changeling rogue. So I've got their AC, passive perception, investigation, insight, and languages and tools that they have. We also have these three NPCs. Two of them I play, one my husband plays, so Lyra is a bard, Flint is a cleric, and Jemetti is a blade singer that my husband plays as well. His main character is Boris, but he also likes to dabble in spells. So the situation is that we've just come back from a one-month hiatus for various reasons. My stepdaughter was unavailable, and then my husband and I just moved to Portugal. So for the last month, we've been not playing at all. But we just played again for the first time in a month yesterday. So let me show you what that session looked like. Because I always start out with the prep for the next session by reviewing the previous session. And I actually haven't processed this one yet. So this is a list of all of the sessions that we've had. I haven't always put a summary and so that's why some of these are blank. And I've also started to say whether they've gotten a long rest or not. So it's, I say false or true. Now let me click on one of them. This is the standard session template that is always applied, including a fantasy calendar date for this. Now you can see um, I have said that we didn't take a long rest and we did take a short rest. This is just handy if I need to query it later because even though I have my date here, we're in the Feywild, so the time is actually passing a little bit differently from how my players are perceiving it. So it's handy for me to be able to say when they think yesterday was, even if I know yesterday was like an hour ago. TVZ is my tag that says that this should still that this still needs to be processed, and I would normally put the summary here. I also do embed our sessions. This is a recording of the game session. We do this just so we can remember what's happened in the previous ones. And this is where I would normally put the summary, but let's start by reviewing what happened in the session. So we are currently doing Wild Beyond the Witchlight, although it is a very custom game. Wild Beyond the Witchlight is an adventure source book 
that starts at first level. But we started it, I think we were at sixth level. I can't remember exactly right now, but I wanted to go into the Feywild and they picked up a lot of the, the clues. My stepdaughter in particular really, really wanted to go to the Feywild. So I just have been adjusting. All of the difficulties have pretty much changed all of the monsters that they've faced. And I've just taken Wild Beyond the Witchlight as more of an inspiration for story arcs and, and that kind of thing. So where we are is we are in the Palace of Heart's Desire, where we last let off last month. The party had just figured out the lock system getting into the front of the palace. And so they had a bunch of these guards rush out because I said that the lock mechanism was kind of grinding a little bit. And so they just had a huge battle. So the first thing that I did was to figure out who's going to take what loot because I just wanted to make sure that they weren't going to miss anything. And then I did, before the game, this big picture recap of what had been happening, like why exactly they were here in the first place. I don't do this for every session. It's just that we'd been away for a month, so we had all forgotten a lot of things. So I, I talked about how they got into the carnival to begin with, and I tied this in with the fact that they wanted a flying carpet, which I said needed this particular kind of silk that somehow require someone to go into the Feywild for. So we went into Hither, they killed the hag there, Bevlorna Blightstraw. The party actually did this cool thing where in the adventure, the Wild Beyond the Witchlight sourcebook, they actually say that there are there's this aviary where there are messenger birds and that's how the hag and the coven communicate with each other. So they sent a message to Endelin Moongrave pretending to be Bavlorna, whom they just killed, basically asking for help. And their idea was that they would be able to lure Endelin into a trap. Unbeknownst to them, Endelin has the unique ability to be able to foretell a little bit of the future. And I reasoned that she probably knew that this was a trap, but I wanted to reward them for their creativity. I had her actually contact Scabatha, the other hag sister. I had Endelin see this as an opportunity to get rid of Scabatha as well, because I kind of played up on the rivalry between the three sisters. And so it was a really cool fight because um, Endelin didn't show up. Scabatha did initially, just popped in because they can do planar shift. And the party was surprised. And then Endelin popped in. And they were really freaking out at this point because they thought that there's no way that they're going to be able to take the two hags. But they were able to kill Scabatha. And Endelin kind of toyed with them and even ended up helping them kill her sister and then popped away with a special artifact that she stole while she was there from Bad Lorna. And then we went into Zither. They had already killed this hag because Scabatha had gone into Hither, but they did learn some information about what was to come. They learned about the Palace of Heart's Desire, and also they met unicorns that gave, one of them gave them his horn so that they could enter the palace and stop break some people out of stasis, including eventually Zibilna. So we started in the Palace of Heart's Desire. And here I always have a recap of the previous session. And then I had the, the strong start. The strong start was that they entered this castle, they had just killed these guards that came rushing out. And as they were investigating the bodies and the and trying to get some of the armor, because they were mithril armor that these guards had, they started to hear this crackling noise in a nearby room. They opened the door and what they saw was a roiling storm. This was also in the adventure. I really like it and, and I really played up on it. So I had these scenes here. Let's see which ones we already did. And by the way, if you haven't already guessed, I do use a version of Sly Flourish's Steps of the Lazy DM. I always take issue with the Lazy DM part because I feel like in order to be a Lazy DM, you have to be a pretty experienced DM because I, as a non-experienced DM, even 60 sessions into this campaign, 
I feel like I can't afford to be lazy. So I use a bit of a hybrid approach. I do really love his style and hope that I'll be able to have a very impromptu and improv heavy um, kind of session style in the future. But right now I kind of rely on a lot more than I feel he does. So when they open this court of storms, um, the court of storms is this large chamber, and I described it with a tower right in the center and turrets going to it. And then I also said that they that there was something that was kind of floating in the air, but they didn't really know how to get to it. I was actually expecting that they would try to get some people in the party who was with them to to fly. Now they have. They happened to have a rival party with them. I introduced a rival party that was based on Sly Flourish's Grim Accord um, group. And it was supposed to be like a rival adventuring group. But somehow, because my players are players and creative people, they managed to completely subvert my expectations and became friends and allies, tenuous allies. But for now, there's actually like eight of them that are traveling together. So. I had already planned for them to explore this Court of Storms using some of the fly spells that people had, and a couple people had Polymorph as well, and that's what I was prepared for. And they totally didn't do that. They just saw the turrets. They saw that there was a staircase or a walkway going from the turret to, the, to a floor above where they were. So instead of this, they skipped most of the ground floor and and headed up the staircase, which was fine. They saw a bunch of things like the secret library that Zibilna has up there, and they did, at the end, eventually get to go into the Hatches room, where, if you don't know, there's like a, a puzzle there that teleports them into the study, which is the only place that they can actually get to the main event, the throne room, where a big battle is going to take place. So they also found at the end this half work that's kind of frozen in the air. She was the thing that they kind of vaguely saw outside the Court of Storms. And there was this dilemma because she is frozen. Everything in this castle is frozen by some time stasis. And th this is the same magic that has kept Zibilna captive. And the problem is they need to know the name of something and then touch it with a unicorn horn before they can remove that that spell. And the problem is they don't know many of these people, so they meet this this half-orc. Her name's Zareus. I've got a nice image for her. This is from someone named Stephanie Brown. I said that she was going to be a path of the juggernaut barbarian, but they don't they don't know any of that yet. They just saw her kind of frozen after being pushed away from this gaping hole where, where they are. Um, they're not really sure what happened, but she's frozen. And if they don't rescue her, then she's going to die. What they did was, because Aura is a rogue and a really cool one, and she's a, a soul knife, so she has the ability to talk telepathically to people. So I'm pretty sure that in the next session, she's actually going to talk to Soraya's, find out her name, and I'm going to have to have a story for Sir His for what the heck she was doing there, what she knows that can help them in the fight to come. So I've got this. I totally forgot this. Uh, and they did kind of explore, not all of the castle, but some of the castle. And they are now very close to the throne room. So I always have secrets and clues here. Sometimes I take them off as we go, as they figure out some things. but. I don't always get to all of them. So let's see. They already know this. This didn't come up. This didn't come up. Okay, they did know about Baba Yaga. They did get this from the arm from the guards that came out to attack them. And they don't know about Sereus yet. They do know how to get into the throne room. Well, they will next session. They're already in the study. Okay, so they did meet Soraeus. And they didn't get any of the loot. There are also some things that happened 
in the session. They found a few books. They learned a little bit more about the Shadowfell, which I wasn't really expecting, but they asked about it and I gave them some information from Secrets and Clues. So I've got, this is my main vault, which I use for everything, not just D&D. But then I also have this like reference vault, which is filled with things that I didn't write. So it's just things that I've compiled from different sources, including the book Wild Beyond the Witchlight. So they were in the secret library and the secret library already has a bunch of these books. They did ask for books and they did. And um, the rogue or a rolled a really high investigation check. So I gave them The City That Waits. And then, which one was it? Oh, I guess I made one up. I said it was called The Court of the Shadow Fell. So I guess I, I made this one up. I didn't even remember. I'm so glad I wrote it down. Because normally when I make stuff up completely, I forget what I've said. I said that this was more of a historical account, kind of a forbidden... Um, love sort of situation between a woman from the Seelie Court in the Feywild and a man from the Unseelie Court in the Shadowfell. And the product of this union was an offspring that was deemed unnatural by both sides. And they immediately decided that this was Zibilna, who is the main person that they're trying to rescue, but also a very powerful Archfey. And as soon as they said that, I was like, it is now true. <laughs> so now I need to actually put that in my note for her. I'm going to create another section here and I'll say family. Her mother was Baba Yaga, a member of the Sealy Court, and her father. Her father was, I'm not sure who, um, someone from the Unseelie Court in the Shadowfell. That's just so that I remember it next time. <laughs> I know what they're talking about. Say this is personal history. She grew up shunned by both Seelie and Unseelie Courts because she is the only union of both courts. She is considered unnatural. Another interesting thing is because of this book, The City That Waits, we now have some lore about the Shadowfell. They've never really learned anything about the Shadowfell before. I had to kind of improvise some things on the spot, so I want to make sure that I remember that. And by remember, I mean I want to make sure that I take notes on that. Uh, the shadow fell. So I said that this shadow fell had a city called Moyle. So I'm in the shadow fell note. I'm, in, I'm inserting a template and I want to do um, places in place. Okay. So what this is, is a data view query that is going to be based on this place. And this won't return anything right now. So I just. Okay, applied that template, but then when I create this one, this is Moil. So this is a place and uh, location is the Shadow Fell. Oops. And I'll say it's a demi plane. Actually, I'll just say it is a city of haunted spires. Okay, I'm just going to remove the demi plane part just to make it a little bit simpler. Moyle is a city of haunted spires in the Shadowfell. The party found out about this in, and I like to link that session um, from the book, The City That Waits. And I'm not even going to create a page for The City That Waits because I feel like it's probably not going to be that useful. I mean, if it is, I can always create it later on. Another thing that I did, because they were asking for more details about this city, I was kind of taken aback because they said they wanted to spend two hours studying this one book. And I was like, well, I don't know that much about the Shadow Fell or in the Feywild. And so I said that they were, um, that, that the people there were hungry for flesh. The reason that I was thinking this is there is a kobold press book called uh, Empire of Ghouls. And I, I, 
wasn't even sure if it was set in the shadow fell but i just kind of ran with it the people here are all plagued with constant hunger for flesh and so now that i've created this page moil and you'll see that that was also created in the same folder as my campaign because that's how I've set up this template. Now you'll see that this data view query in the Shadowfell has updated. So now I'll have that link to it, which is really good. Okay, so Nav is one of their offsiders, kind of like um, retainers. Another source of D&D information that I like is Matt Colville, and he has this idea of retainers in his book, Strongholds and Followers, and the follow-up, which I also read, but I forgot the name of. Anyway, so they've got one of those, and they even made Nav stay in the secret library, so she's going to have even more information about this when, when they're done. I need to definitely remember that. And they have six hours of Psychic Whispers up and running, although I do suspect Psychic Whispers is that soul knife ability of the rogue that can let her talk to these four people. She has to select the four that she's speaking with, and then she can telepathically talk to them if they're within a mile of her. But I do think that because they've just met Sereus, that she's probably going to redo this because she wants to talk to Soraya. She already pretty much said that she was going to do that. And Tiesa stayed with them as well. Okay, so I'm going to create a summary of the previous session. What I like to do is I like to have it in split view. Okay, so I'm going to do command pane, split vertically, okay. So I'm going to keep the cursor here in session summary, and meanwhile I'm scrolling through this on the side. So the party saw uh, saw the Court of Storms. So I've done that. There now is a summary here, and this is a bit of a longer summary. In case I want to know what happened, like this was this is going to be pulled in. Kind of like how how this was. See, this this recap is from the previous session, and now um, this is all okay here. And I'll just put in the location, Palace of Hearts Desire, and then the date is okay. The summary, okay. Now here in the summary, the summary is like a one second. It, this summary is a one-line description of what happened, just like the, the barest minimum. So I'm going to say, um, already solved, um, hatches riddle, and got teleported to study, rescued service. And then I'll remove the TVZ tag because I no longer need that. Now... Okay, so that was a bit of a longer recap. Now let's actually get to preparing the session. So to do that, I'm going to go back to the world page because this is how I create sessions. So I'm gonna keep this one here because there were a few things that I actually want to remember, like the fact that Nav is here and the psychic whispers. And then I'm gonna click add new session. Now this is going to create another session note here. So when I add it, there's the new one, and now it's 61. It's been automatically added. And this is all based on a templater, and a, and this is buttons, and a quick add macro. There's a few things that are strung together. If you want to see how I implemented that on my Patreon, I do give away this template with all of this set up and working, and you can have a look at that. Um, so this is... 61 and you can see that the summary that I put in is now there and then this one is created. Now I can close this world page and actually start planning. Now you'll see that all of these things are filled in. The location is not because that's something that changes and I fill that out at the end of the session anyway. The summary, um, the tag is back now so I know it's unprocessed. This session summary is blank. Now in the housekeeping is where I'm going to put this. These are notes to myself, pretty much, to remind myself what happened in the last one. Okay, these are things that like are unfinished. 
And then there's a recap that's been automatically pulled in. This is an embed. So this is from the previous session. This is what it actually looks like. This is all automatically generated. And I love that because when I create a new session, it's just add new session and then I'm ready to go. They use the magical rope to tow her into the study. So the strong start is going to be something about Sereus. Or maybe it should also be something about the study. The study that they're in. Because it was kind of at the end, so maybe I will describe a little bit more about what that was. So, let me open up Palace of Heart's Desire, as I had that here. And in the upper level should be... So the throne room is actually below, but they are where this destroyed study is. And here it is. Okay. I'm just going to read this whole thing. This is what the book said, and I am not using this knight at all because I'm using Sereus. So I'm going to copy this whole thing. This is using the callout um, plugin. or it's, it's like core functionality in Obsidian now. Okay, and I'll say that this is destroyed study. So there's a, a hole in the northern wall on the landing between two staircases, one leading up and the other leading down. Stony debris from the blast is frozen in midair outside the tower. And instead of this, I'm going to have Sereus. I'm going to describe her. I already put a note in the session. Oh, actually, one thing that I didn't show you, I'm, let me just go back to the previous one for now. I am going to copy this whole thing. And this is actually a vault that I have with my players. And this is something that I share using Dropbox. So I shared this entire folder with them. And because I'm sharing the entire vault, all of the plugins and, and all of the settings are controlled by the same thing. So they have to worry about installing Obsidian, but they don't have to worry about, you know, updating plugins or anything. So I actually find this way just easier. And I'm going to copy the summary in here just for them. Um, okay. And these were things that I had given them. So here I already gave Soraeus's photo there. So then I'm going to go to the story thus far, go all the way down. This is just a record of all of them that we've got. So this is here, uh, 60, heads reveal the name, and then so the video. And then I'm also going to embed the session summary. That way they can kind of read it in order as well. We've all had to go through these at least once. So they know about Soraeus. So I can just describe her a little bit more. Um, and here I'm just going to put a link to her because I can then just look at her image while I'm describing them. And okay. So this is actually, I'm going to skip a little bit here. This is one of the secrets that I can definitely put. Sereus is, is the daughter of Arnrak, who is raising an army in Jorhas to uh, fight to free Lukatoa. Scenes. First, um, talking to Sereus and figuring out what she knows and where she's really from. Okay. Well, before that, they're definitely going to have um, psychic whisper. Free her from stasis. Now, Sereus would have uh, experienced some sort of big battle. Uh, why was she involved? She was probably trying to stop Endelin. So, Endelin Moongrave is attempting to use Zenona's cauldron to create a rift between the Shadowfell and Wyrot. And the Feywild. Endelin plans to unleash an army of hungry ghouls from the Shadowfell 
and bring them into the prime material plane. So I think that what she's trying to do is create a rift between the Shadowfell and the Pri and the Feywild, bring the shadow, bring the ghouls from the Shadowfell, and eventually into our world, into the prime material plane, and free this god. I'm jumping into the middle of the story here, so I apologize if it's a little bit complex, but I hope that you're still understanding how I plan for a session. Okay, so Psychic Whispers, uh, talking to Soraya, and so figuring out what she knows and where she's really from, which is going to be interesting because one of the things about this adventure, as in rules as written or source book as written, is that each of the characters has like a secret or something that they've lost in this realm. Now, I already know that um, the thing that Aura has lost is her sibling. She doesn't actually know who this person is. Remember, Aura's a changeling, and so she just knows that she has a twin sibling. She's assumed that it's a sister. I've never actually said sister, uh, but she's already met this person. She just doesn't know it. So Arrow is trapped in a necklace that is wearing and is linked to her through blood link potion. Okay, so I have this item called a blood link potion. Yeah, it's from the Vault of Magic. So I'm just going to copy the obsidian URL here. I'm switching back and forth between two vaults. I just kind of like to have them separate. One, my main vault are all things that I've written, and then this one is all things that are referenced. So I, I take very good care to separate the sources there. Blood link potion. And this is going to be interesting because if they do fight, then it's going to be, well, I mean, they are going to fight her, but it's going to be a problem because hurting Endolin is also going to hurt Arrow. The thing that Boris has lost is his memory of Hardrack going by the name of Throg when they were younger. So Boris is a barbarian, a half-orc barbarian from this tribe of full orcs, and he didn't have a good time growing up, and he thinks that he's killed his his best friend, Hardrak, that he grew up with. Unbeknownst to him, Hard Hardrak actually survived and is now wreaking havoc, and he is fighting for Ukatoa. So that's going to be a fun reveal. And then what else? Um, I've got this thing here about the final encounter. Hey, I do have this witch light arc. I have a few notes here for what's happened. Okay, right. Now I wanted... The party are expecting that Endolin is going to be there and that she's going to be the one that they fight and that Zabilna's probably captured somewhere. I wanted to turn that on, on its head. They probably will not fall for it, right? But I do want to make them think. Um, I'm going to say that Endolin has disguised herself as Zabilna and transformed the real Zabilna into the form of Endolin. The only clues that has done this are that Arcanox, to build this pet, is under a spell. He's under a dominant beast's spell nearby. Okay, um, so then I guess after they talk to Soraeus, I want to include something because she is from Jorhas, so she would know something about Jorhas. So I'm going to put a, a, a secret or two here. I'm going to put Sunbreaker. This is why it's really handy to have so many notes because I already did some work on what's happening in Jorha. So now, now that they're meeting someone from there, I could just go and have a look and choose from a bunch of different secrets. Sunbreaker Alman, um is missing. He died in battle. But nobody knows where his re reincarnated form is, soul is. Unbeknownst to the party, this is actually Boris. He's been he's been reincarnated into 
Morris's current form. One of the main things, I, th I feel like I need to stress about the danger of this oh, throg. So I'm going to put something here, throg. The titan knuckled is Riki, is a half orc, half titan, armed with a powerful artifact called Ruin's Wake. He has unified orc tribes, and his tribes have begun building something on the southern coast of Jorhas. Okay, and I'll do this one. So that was a secret for Boris. And I'll do this secret as well for Aura. Because she's interested in changelings. Okay. So I've got scenes. Um, all right, I probably need to fill out the scenes. Talking to Sirius, figuring out what she knows and where she's really from. Okay. And then I think, let me go back to that. I believe that all they need to do to get to the throne room is to go down the stairs. This chamber can be reached by descending a staircase from area 47. Okay, the next step is going to be preparing for battle and descending the staircase. Confronting Gwendolyn Runegrave in the final battle. I don't know if we're actually going to be able to finish the battle next time, but maybe I should plan for them being able to defeat her. Actually, before that, I do want to add something that they that I haven't that I keep forgetting to do. Okay, yeah. They need to somehow get a gift from the Summer Queen. I'm gonna copy this. Okay. Um getting gift from the Summer Queen. She's a very powerful ally. Okay, and I'm gonna put some loot there. This Grimshaw comb from Sir Talavar. Uh, this is the one from the Summer Queen Snickersnack, which maybe Sereus is going to give them, and then figuring out Endolin's last deception. She isn't, is pretending to be. So. Okay. What's another secret? Um, the other party that they're with, the Grim Accord, now they actually want a few things. They have agreed with the party, with my players, that they want these three things, these three items, one from each witch. They already have this power of conflicts, so they need the Kiss of the Change Bringer. Okay. I'm going to say one of them actually doesn't care about the arrangement. The arrangement was that they would, both parties would try to kill all of the witches first and then divide the spoils. I think Yuri doesn't care about that. Um, just wants to get the kiss of the change bringer, which is uh, the same gem that Arrow is imprisoned in. So I'm going to take those because those are loot too. I mean, they might not get it, but they might as well. Here I'm going to put the Palace of Heart's Desire and then link specifically to the throne room so I can just jump to that in game. Okay. All right. Then I can like read all of this out. I'm going to copy this treasure too. They probably won't get this because this is actually on Zabilna, but you never know. And the biggest part, if they do defeat Zabilna, level 10 and a free feat. So this is going to be a really hard fight. So I had planned to finish all of this while recording it, but you know, there are a lot of people like Sly Flourish when he does his D&D &D prep shows or Numenera, whatever he's playing. He just like is able to plan so little. Now, if I actually showed you how much I planned, then it would be a very boring video. If you've stayed with me so far, thank you all for still being here. This is how I plan a session in Obsidian. I hope that even though I didn't plan the entire session, that you got at least a bit of a taste of how I would go through it. And I really love Obsidian as a tool for just this. I really don't know what I would do with that obsidian. I probably would not be a DM right now, and I don't think that's an exaggeration. Let me know if you liked this video. This is a bit of a longer one. 
maybe it's too niche. So let me know in a comment if you'd like to see more of this or if you wouldn't like to see more of this. And if you were interested in this, then check out this video that I made on how I've created this D&D reference vault in Obsidian with all of the monsters that are data view queryable and all of the items that I've collated from different books. As always, thank you for watching and thought scenes.